Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Sunday. We have more worship, another message. Um, we're glad to be back in person, um, but I know some of you are staying home to watch us online, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, we miss you, um, and we hope to see you soon. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. Dancing in the arms of forever, singing like I'm walking on water. You are life, life in me. Grayest eyes, living color, you have called us in your life, light and made a way for us in your love you are life I'm living in the light of my Savior dancing in the arms of forever I'm singing like I'm walking on water you are life alive in me I give my life to follow cause your love is all I want now you are life
darkness into your glorious day. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You call my name. I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Hi friends, welcome to another week here 456 online. We are so excited that you've decided to join us today. Um, we are plugging and chugging through David. But before we get there, I have a couple of announcements that I made last week um, here in person um, that I wanted to tell you guys about too. So um, if you guys are in Out Loud or have ever, have ever been in Out Loud, um, it's the... Miss Christine has you guys sing and you do worship um, for kids at UC once a month or something like that. I don't really remember how it works, but um, so that is happening on January 20th. If you would like to participate, feel free to. Um, if not, totally fine as well. Um, second announcement, uh, camp. We are going back to camp. So we went last summer for those of you who um, didn't know or have never been here before. Um, we went to Camp Ileana down in Washington, Indiana. Super fun time. Um, we had a blast while we were there. You got to do like a giant swing um, and a zip line and it was a bunch of fun. Um, so we're going again this summer, June 6th through the 10th. The registration will open in February and you'll hear more about it later on. But if you want to go, feel free to reach out and I am more than happy to give you some more information about it. Um, but I wanted to let you guys know those two pretty cool things. Um, since you guys weren't here in person, you still get to find out. So that's all I got. We'll jump right into uh, the life of David. So when we left David, he had brought his best friend Jonathan's crippled and outcast son Mephibosheth um, into his home and he ate at his table like a king's son. He got all this land, became very wealthy. He had showed amazing, undeserved kindness. Um, and it was like a really, it was like a high moment for David, right? It fit very well with his character and who we have seen him to be up to now. Um, he showed grace and that he was a man after God's own heart. Like it just fit very, very well. And this week, I know you can probably tell, um, we're going to take a look at probably the lowest point in David's life. Um, there has been no sin, except for maybe the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that has been talked about as much as David and Bathsheba's. Uh, Hollywood has, has utilized it to make movies and TV shows, and authors have used it to tell um, as like a plot for their stories and for you know countless books. And it's this one instance in David's life that we remember so often. Like, can you imagine for just a second, the biggest oops in your life being broadcast to all people for forever? Like, when people think of King David, yes, they think of a man after God's own heart, but if that's not the first thing, David and Bathsheba is. This one mistake that he made, that it affected the rest of his life afterwards. So a little bit of context before we jump into like reading what happens. Um, David at the time is about 50 years old um, and he's been the king of Israel for about 20 years now. So he's gotten pretty comfortable in what he's doing. It's been um, about two decades since, you know, his time on the run and 
Saul and Jonathan and all of that like really big drama that happened um, before he became king. So we're going to read from 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to read through pretty much all of the chapter, but we're going to start and stop and start and stop because that's it's a dramatic story and this is the fun way to read it. So here we go. 2 Samuel chapter 11. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Pause. Okay, so here's what happens. <laughs> David's already in some hot water. We're just through the first verse. So it's the spring and this is typically when kings will go out to war and David, he stayed home. So a king will normally go to battle um, with his army. They may not necessarily be involved in the fighting, but they'll go and they'll like command and do all sorts of cool things. And you know, Saul, he would always go into battle with his army against David and whatever. So that's normal. A king goes with his army into battle. And David stayed home. David, you aren't supposed to be at home right now. You should be out at war with the rest of your army, not sitting at home doing nothing. But he's gotten lazy and comfortable in his life. And, but that's not the worst of it. Let's keep, keep going. So, verse 2. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. From the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. She came to him, and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Okay, pausing once again. So the Bible tells us that she is unbelievably pretty, this girl. So David, he goes out, and he's like walking around, and he looks out over this balcony and he sees this woman bathing in her house. Uh, probably more than likely on the roof or on a patio outside. That's how their houses were set up. So he sees her and she's bathing. Now, red flag that she is, that the Bible points out that she was pretty. Like, unbelievably beautiful. So, red flag that this is probably not going to be good. This isn't going to go in a very godly place. Um, since we already know, David, you're not supposed to be at home right now. So he sends someone to find out who the heck this girl is. And the person comes back and he says, Well, I'm pretty sure her name's Bathsheba, and she's the daughter of this man, and she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Side note, Uriah, we find out much later on, is one of like the greatest soldiers that David had in his army. Super loyal, faithful, great guy. Bathsheba is the wife of Uriah. So he can think that she's pretty, right? That's fine. But then you find out she's married to somebody else And still, he says, well, bring her here. And then they lay in bed together. They sin together. And in this one moment, God had become so distant from David. David had forgotten that he was God's man. He had forgotten all the lessons he had learned, all the, all the battles he had won with God at his side. He had forgotten all of the cool ways that God had blessed him. He had forgotten God. In one moment, he forgot who God was. David had said no to things he should have said yes to, and he said yes to things he should have said no to. He ignored warning signs and disregarded any possible consequence to what he did. And when we read this, this terrible story, and guys, we are only like four verses into the whole chapter. But when we read this terrible story, we so often think that this whole sin was David. David messed up, he did the thing, he was bad, and we just kind of think Bathsheba didn't have a choice. 
but she did. She knew full well what she was doing when she went out to bathe. She knew who could see her. She knew what she was in view of. She messed up just as much as David did. Just as much. But David is at fault here too. If he had gone to war, he wouldn't have been home to see her. And if Bathsheba had thought seriously about her actions, she wouldn't have put temptation in his path. Both messed up. But David keeps messing up. Like the mess up doesn't just stop with committing a sin with another man's wife. It keeps going. Verse 5. The woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Consequence number one of their sin, Bathsheba gets pregnant and Uriah, her husband, nowhere to be found. Now, David has two options here. First one, he can go to God and he can admit that he was royally screwed up. And he can say he is sorry and accept the forgiveness and the grace that God gives. And then he has to go to his council and the nation and say, I messed up. I'm sorry. Or he can go the route of deception and continuing to sin. And David chooses wrong. Verse 6. David sent Joab, so Joab is the commander in his army, saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and didn't go down to his own house. So when, David, so when they told David, saying, Uriah didn't go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go to your own house? Uriah said to David, The ark of Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Wait here today, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went to, out to lie on his bed with the servants of his lord. But he did not go down to his house. So he calls Bathsheba's husband Uriah for more. And, you know, he, like, fakes it, saying, like, oh, how's the war going? And, like, how's Joab doing? And how are the people? Like, is everything good? He's lying. He doesn't care. He wanted an excuse to get Uriah home, all so that Uriah could go lay down with his wife so that her pregnancy now looks like it came from Uriah and not from David. But here's the thing. What David didn't take into account was how great of a person Uriah actually was. Like, the whole bit about the Ark of the Lord resides in a tent and the armies at war, it was custom at the time that if the army is at war and you are a part of the army and you're like not there for a reason like this, you don't go home. Like he does not feel comfortable living it up in the lap of luxury while his buddies are off camping in tents and fighting for the nation of Israel. And so he says, I, I can't go to see my wife. I can't, because none of my friends can. So I'm gonna stay right here. I'm gonna sleep on the ground like they are, way off in some other part of the country. I'm gonna stay here. <laughs> so now David starts to get pretty nervous, and panicking, as we um, are about to find out, never leads to uh, great decisions. So, verse 14. In the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle. Retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So David writes a letter. And in the letter, he tells Joab, the commander of his army, put Uriah in the front and then run away so that he dies. This is not 
boding well for David at all. So it was, while Joab besieged the city, that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there would be violent fighting. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. He charged the messenger, saying, When you finish telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises, and he says to you, Why did you not approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would stoop from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Anna, keep going, not a woman, why did you not go near the wall? Then you shall say to King David, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So David has now successfully ordered the death of another man whose wife, he got pregnant. David, our shepherd boy David, our shepherd boy turned runaway turned king of Israel, the man after God's own heart has now committed murder after committing covetedness and adultery a week earlier. David is a panic-stricken king. He is frustrated to the point of rage at this failing plan. No matter what he does, he cannot seem to pull off this strategy of deception. He can't cover up his sin fast enough. And surely not in the way he wants to. So he keeps escalating and escalating and escalating until finally he commits murder of not one man, but because of the way that he had his army go into battle, other people, innocent soldiers, died too. And this happens to us too, hopefully on a much smaller scale we are not committing murder by proxy. But when we are in the midst of panic, we don't make good decisions. You start to fake it till you make it, but sin can never be covered up entirely. It all will come to light at some point. And that's what makes this whole story so shocking. Throughout the entire time we've been studying David, Saul had always been the one to screw up, right? David had his mess ups here and there, you know, but he always came out on top. He was always the ideal king and Saul was the one that we were like, oh, why would you do that? But now we are seeing David as a human that is capable of sinning. David can screw up too. And there's a couple verses left, but the story ends and David seemingly covers up his sin and he marries Bathsheba after Uriah dies and you're like, it looks okay, right? Like, oh, he got his new wife pregnant, like that makes sense. But this isn't the happy ending that we read about a long time ago when David married Abigail after Nabal died, right? Nabal was an awful person. Uriah, great person. Abigail, great person. Bathsheba, mm, questionable character. And lots of people, like I said, pay the price for David's sin on the battlefield that day, right along with Uriah. But David doesn't seem to care. The only thing he cared about was covering up the one sin he had committed. David sinned, plain and simple. And to the human beings around him, he covered it up. They had no idea. But here's the thing about sin. It doesn't stay covered for long. And God always sees it happen. You cannot hide your sin from God and God doesn't just let your sin slide. When evil comes about, God has to confront the evil that he sees. Even if that is brought about from his own children. And for 11 months, so between Chapter 11, verse 27, so the last verse in chapter 11 and the first verse of chapter 12 that we'll talk about next week, there is almost an entire year's worth of time. So for these 11 months between marrying Bathsheba and his sin finally being confronted, David sits. God lets him sit. David, you sit with your guilt of what you have done and he lives with the immediate consequences 
of like her getting pregnant and Uriah dying. And he lives with those and he thinks I'm good. He thinks he's in the clear. And here's the thing. In one, in one sentence, in one moment, in one thoughtless action, David sinned. But in that moment, he didn't think it was bad. Because the devil, Satan, he never tips his hand when it comes to temptation. He only shows you the beauty, the fun, the excitement, the good feelings that come in the moment of the sin. But he will never tell you about the crappy consequences that are sure to follow afterwards. The guilt that you feel, and sometimes the consequences that last a lifetime. Because David messed up right here, the rest of his life is probably not what it could have been. And that's what makes Satan so tricky, is that he sneaks in when you let your guard down and he makes sin feel fun. And then you hit the wall, you wake up from the dream and you suddenly realize the gravity of what you've done. And this is where we're just gonna leave David sitting for 11 months with the weight of how he's messed up, thinking that he got away with it. Because sometimes that's where God just leaves you. He lets you sit with it. He lets it eat away at you and grind until you hit the wall and the confrontation happens. And next week, we will read all about the confrontation that happens with David and just how much he learns about how to deal with sin. Let's pray. God, uh, thank you for this story. It is hard, it is rough, it is sad. It is sad to see this man fall so far. But we are so thankful that, that it happened because it teaches us about you about how you deal with sin and how you deal with us and the grace that is offered and the forgiveness. And, and God, we pray that we can say no to the temptation when it comes creeping up, when we're, when we're tired, and that we can turn the other way and that we won't fall into the same trap that David did like when he gave into it. I pray that we will be strong in our trust, in our faith, in our love for you and your love for us, and that we will let that lead us throughout the rest of our time. I pray that you will bring us all back here safely next week so that we can learn just about confrontation and forgiveness and grace once again. Pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right, friends, that's all I got for you. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Sorry it was a downer, but I promise it'll get better next week. Okay? Because it's never the end of the story when the sin happens. God's always got a plan somewhere else. So, with that, may the Lord bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. Give you peace. I will see you right here next week. Bye. <laughs>